what I think is if God is real then God is real and that means everybody has a longing for God and actually I think that's true because I think even if you look at it anthropologically historically every culture in the world is built around God in some way they may have a different understanding of it they may be wrong or right about this that or the other but they're all focusing at some point on where they think the divine is it's always at the heart of every culture except this one which has decided to pretend that's not real for a bit mm. but that's not going to work because mm. I think humans have a need for it they have a need for God because that's what we're supposed to do that's where we're supposed to be orientated so if that's true then we're going to want to look in that direction even though the whole culture is telling us that that's nonsense Welcome to Reenchanting. We are the podcast from Seen and Unseen, and you can, as ever, find much more from us and much more content in general at seenandunseen.com. I am Belle Tyndall. And I'm Justin Briley. And if you are watching this on video, if you could like and subscribe to the channel, if you are listening via podcast, if you could rate and review the show, and that helps as many people as possible discover Reenchanting. And discover guests like Paul Kingsnorth, mm -hmm. who joins us today. Very excited about having Paul with us here at Lambeth Palace Library. Paul is an award-winning poet and author of works including the Buckmaster Trilogy. He's also been deeply involved over the years in the eco ecology and environmental movement. But in 2021, Paul surprised his fans by announcing his conversion to Orthodox Christianity. Uh, you can find out more about Paul at his popular website. He's writing as well at his substack, The Abbey of Misrule. Mm, so we're going to be talking to Paul about why he became a Christian um, and also wondering whether faith could be the key to our modern the crisis of meaning and ecology. So we're going to be talking about re-enchanting all things nature, our world and our place within it. Welcome along, Paul. Thanks very much. Good to be here. Uh, I'm glad we're here as well because we've got the, the lovely view over the London skyline here we at Lambeth Palace Library. Sure, we have. It's, uh, and we'll, we'll give you a little tour afterwards as Look well. forward to that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Tell us, though, because we're at the top of the library, our first question is always, what are you currently reading? What's on your, your bedstand at the moment? Well, there's always too much on my bedstand. <laughs> I've got a huge pile of books I never get around to reading. Um, I'm actually studying a course in Orthodox theology at the moment. So um, the, the problem with this, of course, is that you have 2,000 years worth of reading to catch up on, <laughs> which is impossible. So a lot of things. Um, one thing I read for pleasure is uh, a book I, I keep rereading, actually, which is Wounded by Love by mm. St. Porphyrios who's a very recent saint from the Orthodox Church. He was a Greek Orthodox priest in, in Athens for a long time, a very humble monk, and it's a collection of his sayings, and it's, it's a beautiful book, actually, mm. whether or not you're Orthodox or even Christian, actually. It's mm. really lovely and very funny mm. and very profound, very Christian in a kind of really simple, beautiful sense. So that's very good. Um, another book I read that I finished just a couple of days ago is a book by Charles Foster uh, called The Selfless Gene, which is also very good. It's a response to... It's a response to uh, a kind of new atheist rationalism, but it's also a response to a, a literalist creationist view right. of the world. He's trying to reconcile God and mm. Darwin, actually, which he does very well. Mm. It's really good. So if you have questions about how Christianity and evolution fit together, it's a really good book. And he's a great writer as well. So, so that's, uh, yeah. that's my light reading for right. the week. <laughs> that's yeah. light. That is my light reading. <laughs> that's what I read for fun. What, yes. What's the name of the saint again? Saint Porf Saint Porphyrios. Porphyrios. Saint Porphyrios. And, and um, what kind of a saint were they? Were they relatively recent? Saint something? Porphyrios died in 1991, uh, okay. and he was very had a very very interesting life. He ran away from home at the age of 12 because he decided he wanted to be a monk <laughs> without telling his parents. <laughs> ran off to Mount Athos, the Orthodox monastic republic. They wouldn't they couldn't let him in because he was too young, but they smuggled him in anyway. <laughs> then he had to leave because he got sick, and eventually went back to his parents. His mother was so angry that she'd become a, he'd become a monk that she wouldn't talk to him. <laughs> Um, and she reconciled with him later, but then he lived a very humble life, mostly in a, in a medical, in a hospital chapel in Athens. And then later he founded a monastery. Um, but he had these remarkable prophetic gifts and healing gifts, and 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 he was just very humble and very funny and very mm. very human. Uh, and the book's a collection of just his, his sayings and story of his life. Right. It's well worth reading, actually. Yeah, it's mm. very lovely. Uh, interesting form of teenage rebellion go, going off to become a monk it is it's proper teenage rebellion you know yeah. this is re real countercultural stuff that <laughs> is that might yeah. be the ultimate teenage that rebellion is, these that days. is yeah um, anyone can mm. join a punk band or whatever you know becoming <laughs> a monk boring. that's the real thing yeah. Yeah. 
Wounded. I have also read Wounded by Love, and it is epic. It's a lovely book. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Belle, I'm discovering throughout this podcast, is very well read, far far more well read than I am, because <laughs> that was the first time I've heard of, of this sentence. Oh, so really? I think yeah. geeky is just the word <laughs> I would use. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Nothing, Nothing wrong with that. that. <laughs> I work in the right place for it, yeah. sitting on top of a it library right way. now. Yeah, you've got plenty of reading to get through, and they're like the eight floors below you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, can you tell us a little bit about your journey into writing and poetry, where it sort of bubbled up from within you? It's very hard to say. I mean, writers mm. are people who just can't not write. That's the best definition I've mm. ever come across. That's, so, that's good. And I've always just, when I, I've just loved books from when I was very young. I just mm. read all the time. My parents read to me a lot when I was very small. That probably helped. Uh, and then I've just been an obsessive reader. And if you're an obsessive reader, eventually you start writing. And then I just didn't stop. And since, since when you're a writer, the world you can create in your head are better than the actual mm. world. You think to yourself, <laughs> how can I, can I make a living doing this? Could I do this forever? Could I wonder if I could get books published? It'd be very exciting. So, so I've just done that. And yeah. I've, I've mm. started off in sort of journalism and bits and pieces. I've always tried to make a living with words. And that's just, as I say, I, I, I can't not do it. Sometimes I'd like to stop doing it, mm. but I just haven't been able to yet. So it's just, yeah, it's just always been there. Yeah, it's like um, just having to get thoughts out, even if no one's asked for them. <laughs> having to <laughs> yeah, let yeah, you it can't spill stop talking, out yeah. somewhere. Yeah. And it's also, yeah, it's a way of that. working out what you think, especially yes. non-fiction writing. Yes. I mean, the stuff I'm writing at the moment has really been a two-year series of essays in trying to work out what I think. Yeah. I, th I think I know what I think, but when you start to write it down, it becomes more complex and mm. you learn all sorts of things and then mm. some ideas work and some don't. So it's it's a way of engaging with the world, and it's like you say, if you it, it's you can't stop. Mm. You have to get it out, and if people won't listen to you, just write it down. <laughs> <laughs> write it anyway. Even if it's in your diary yeah. and no one sees it, <laughs> yeah. it's okay as long as you write it down. So yeah. yeah, it's a way of working out what the world is and what you are, and you're sort of working out your faith sort of in public as you go along. Well, I do seem to be doing that, yeah, which is a bit <laughs> awkward. Um, that's the trouble with being a writer and then having something like this happen is that you write about it and then more people ask you to write about it and then they ask you to come on their podcasts and then you have to sort of explain yourself even when you don't know what you're doing. So so you have to be a bit careful. Yeah. But, but it's, you know, I, I don't know any other way to do it other than sort of mm. writing it out and seeing what and, happens. And nature and the great outdoors has always sort of been part of that journey as far as I can see in terms of the way it's woven into your books and your poetry and I think just growing up you were kind of you, you spent a lot of time in the in, in nature didn't you yeah well that was that was my dad's responsibility really he used to take me on very long walks when I was a kid like two two weeks long we'd walk the wow. Pennine Way or the Pembrokeshire Coast Path which hey. I walked when I was very young lots of beautiful long distance paths all across Britain and we do a lot of camping on the mountains and so I was very immersed in it. I mean I grew up in the suburbs of London and then High Wycombe so a very ordinary kind of <laughs> suburban life but uh, so going out into the hills was an escape from that yeah. and this, these were in the days when you could actually go out and nobody had a smartphone so when you went up a mountain you were up a mountain mm. you weren't someone tweeting on the top of it right so you you were in you were in the wilderness even in England you could still get out into the wilderness to some degree so I had a real sense of there was something I always had a sense that there was something very powerful and very beautiful in nature and then mm. later on at school I discovered Wordsworth and Wordsworth was kind of putting words to these feelings that there was something very profound so I was a sort of pantheistic nature lover for a long time I wouldn't call myself pantheistic anymore, but I still have the same sense that there's something very divine and sacred and beautiful in the, in the natural world. Mm. And, and we, we've got a big problem when we're so divorced from it. So that was just mm. the way that, if I look back now, I could say I think those were religious yeah. experiences, actually, but I would never have put it in those uh, words. Though you did have a sort of semi-teenage atheist sort of... Period. Yeah, I mean, intellectually, I did. I definitely went through the, my sort of Richard Dawkins phase before I'd heard of Richard Dawkins. <laughs> you know, I thought it was very clever to explain to all the Christians why they were all so wrong. But, <laughs> but that was just me being an idiot when I, was, when I was 16. So I sort of grew out of it. I mean, I sort of believed it. I, I was somebody who I was, I was spiritual, but not religious. Uh -huh. Right. So yeah, I, yeah. I knew that organized religion was bad. But right. at the same time, I was never a, a sort of dematerialized rationalist person mm. who thought that the, the world was you, just a gene you bank, never you thought know. nature was disenchanted no i always sense. thought yeah. i always felt that there was something in the world that i could experience and so you know i was i was a lover of fantasy novels and mm. i was very interested mm. in ghosts and, and the supernatural still am actually and so the, the all the the other apparent dimensions that i was sure existed i was always interested in that but i never i would never have uh, associated it with god or anything like mm. that that was not mm. something that i thought i was interested in i didn't have any religious upbringing so 
Mm. And if I had done, I wouldn't have been interested anyway because it didn't seem didn't seem relevant. So and and you know when you're young, certainly back in the eighties, that's the kind of thing you're rebelling against. Yeah, because that's the man you're sticking it to the man. So yeah. so you walk away from that. But no, I, I've never been sort of disenchanted actually mm. in in the sense that I ever thought the world was just a mm. a material thing. So as I say, I think right from the beginning I've had a a, a religious sensibility actually. Mm. That's really interesting. So what was it about, because obviously like, you're in a different place now, but back then, what was it about Christianity that you were like, that won't tick any of my boxes? Like there's nothing about Christianity that will explain or define anything that I'm feeling sort of in nature. Well, I don't know really. I mean, it wasn't just Christianity. It was anything at all. I mean, my, my mm. best friend at school was a Muslim and, um, you know, he was very committed to his religion in a sort of quiet way. And sometimes I'd go around his house and he'd have all his sort of praying garb on and, and I'd sort of look at him and think, well, it's a bit weird <laughs> but you know it seems to make him happy but I thought I was much cleverer than all that and it just it wasn't well, look I mean I, I sort of had this when I grew up in England in the 80s there was a sort of Church of England thing going on and that and so I, I, there was always you know we had RE at school and um, there were these two types of vicars that you would meet there was the very stuffy old Victorian vicar who seemed to be coming from another world and then there was the trendy vicar with the beard and the guitar who wanted to make Jesus your friend <laughs> and that was even worse I much prefer the traditional vicar I didn't want anything to do with the I'm trendy literally vicar. picturing people I know <laughs> oh there's lots of them around and they'd, they'd come and do sermons about I remember a particular one where someone wanted to compare Jesus to a bunch of bananas I can't remember why but it was, it was terrible I'd love to know that was what awful. the analogy was and you know was. they'd always be quoting pop songs and things that was <laughs> really bad and it was just cringe it was very cringe and so you just thought what has this got to do with me? And yeah. it just sounded like morality lessons. That's all it was. Jesus mm. says, do this. And it's like, mm. well, why do I need Jesus to tell me to do that? Mm. Uh, so it didn't, it didn't seem relevant, but I wasn't looking for it. You know, yeah. I wasn't in that space yeah. where that was anything that interested me. So I could just have a good laugh about it. It wasn't, it wasn't something I felt like I needed and no one had ever explained to me what it was. So Christianity okay. or any other religion didn't seem. Sure. And, you know, back in the day, uh, and probably still the 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 kind of the myth of progress is is our is our story and we're supposed to have transcended religion that's mm. a silly superstition that people used to have and we've all gone beyond that now <laughs> um and that's sort of what what i probably complacently yeah. thought the world was you know mm. so before we get to your own point at which you changed your mind your life was very much shaped by nature by your concern for it uh, ecology environmentalism and so on over time though i think you you became a bit disillusioned with the movement so do you want to talk us through sort of what happened on that level where where that passion mm. came from and but what what made you want to sort of yeah well there's um, a couple of things really i mean if we go back to the sense that nature is that in nature you can see the divine which i think is now what i was going on mm. yeah um you know nature is the book of god um mm. If God is an artist, which I think he probably is, then nature is his artwork, right? And, mm. and we're part of it, incidentally, because we're natural too. So I could always, I had a sense that that's what it was. That was what was going on. So I had a very incohate sense that nature was a, was a sacred thing in some way. I wouldn't necessarily have used that word. But when I saw a forest being destroyed to make toilet paper, that felt like sacrilege. It still does. Mm. It seems like a, like a violent, stupid abuse of the world um, and a worship of mammon and all of the other things that we would, we would see now. Um, and so I wanted to protect it, and so that led to me becoming an activist, and my writing got diverted into a long period of using my writing to try and, and talk about that, fiction, mm. non-fiction, poetry, whatever, almost activist writing, but also just trying to explain the, the importance of the sacred in nature. And so I was a, 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 a involved in the green movement for a long time. I suppose I became disillusioned, firstly, because it became clear that the, the scale of the destruction wasn't something we were going to change. Right. And we're not going to stop the climate changing now at this point. Um, and, and that kind of activism doesn't work on a large scale. It can work on a small scale. But So there was a sense that it was sort of past the point of no return. But more than that, it was a sense that the green movement has gone down. The mainstream, anyway, it's a very broad movement. But the mainstream of the green movement has gone down a very technocratic road in which uh, we have this thing called environmentalism. And we talk about, in very technical terms, about biodiversity and carbon credits. And, and so we've we've taken this sacred divine manifestation of natural beauty and turned it into a sort of a cold dead accounting thing where we've all got to be sustainable and reduce right. our carbon and 
and the solution to the problem is always more technology. It's always putting but it's wind never farms about on actually the mountains. Changing our it's never lifestyle. about changing our lifestyle. It's never yeah. about having less. It's never about mm. seeing nature as, as something that is more than a. Right. I was an environmentalist because I believed nature was a was something that should be protected because it just obviously should because mm. it was mm. it yeah. was. That's, I'd say that's a religious sensibility, but you don't have to have a religion to mm, see that. It's mm. a normal human reaction, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I still think that. And I think much of the environmental movement has become so obsessed with carbon and technology that it's got lost. Uh, it thinks that covering mountains in wind farms is a good solution because what it actually wants to do is sustain technological society going forward, making us all richer and wealthier. And actually, I think that what we need to do is have a lot less and live more simply. Um, but that's virtually impossible <laughs> in the society we live yeah. in. It's been made very, very hard to do that. So I think it's about relationship. Yeah. Our relationship with nature is very broken. Mm. And if we have a relationship with the rest of nature, which just sees it as something that can be calculated and, and, and sorted out with technology, then we've done to nature the same thing we've kind of done to our culture, which has turned it into a machine. Mm. So that was, that was my disillusion, mm. really. Mm. Yeah, so I guess sort of to really oversimplify what you're saying but to make sure I've got it right in my head is that it's it's not about what the environmental movement at the moment is it's about using the machine in a sort of a better way rethinking mm. how we in how we use way. it yes. in a sustainable right, right. way rather than thinking actually is it something to be is it a machine yeah, to be used exactly. in general or is it mm. something completely different yeah exactly yeah. I mean, what, what are we trying to do are we trying to create a giant technological digital society which doesn't produce carbon and is mm. sustainable mm. or are we t are we looking at our way of life our modern way of life which mm. i always have and said actually no this is the wrong way to live yeah we're so disconnected from nature we're so atomized and isolated yeah. and dependent on our technology that we've broken a lot of relationships mm. human and non-human that's what i always felt mm. and a lot, a lot of environmentalists still obviously do feel that but mm. the the mainstream of the movement has and gone it down feels like that's path. only sped up in the last few years yeah it really has it's sped up very fast since covid i think everything's become even more digitized than before um we're living on screens even more than before and the future is just taking us in that direction mm. and it's and, it's and so wrong direction. If, if all we're doing in our environmental activity is kind of ensuring we can sustain this world yeah exactly well, so what do, want want <laughs> yeah. what do you want to sustain what do you want to sustain i mean yeah. what does sustain mean it just means make something that can keep going so what yeah. are you trying to sustain you're trying to sustain the natural world or are you trying to sustain this Techni this technological machine we've, this we've created are you for trying ourselves? to sustain capitalism yeah. or progress or mm. growth or wealth what are you trying to sustain and that's what sustainability actually now means is making modern western capitalist technological society uh, bulletproof almost shockproof you know get mm. rid of the carbon use use something else instead but that's that's a technological question it's not a it's not a mm. deeper one what's their mm. actual relationship with nature is the question i want to answer yeah. you talk about how that got weird after covid and that's such a shame because i remember in the midst of it it felt like oh this could be this mm. could be a moment you know like yeah we're so there was a moment right at the, the beginning wasn't there yeah, yeah, there was. it, yeah. and the clouds that we we weren't living that's in the true. smog and Absolutely. all that yeah. that's yeah. very true yeah. and there was a moment at the beginning where the cars weren't on the roads and people yeah. went home and, and spent time with their children <laughs> yeah. and you thought oh actually and look at all the stuff i'd forgotten yeah. about yeah exactly and seeing very how true. nature reacted to us shrinking mm was such a beautiful oh, thing good. and we were all so enchanted with it yeah. at the time so it's such a shame that that hasn't yeah, but then we got straight back on the bandwagon we got didn't we? straight we're back on it yeah we're not very good at learning those sorts no, of things no we're are humans we? are very bad at learning from their mistakes aren't they i think that's a yeah. good lesson from history unfortunately <laughs> we do yeah. do that talk to us about your own journey when it comes to faith though paul because uh i know that you've have sort of had a religious sense about you uh, over your adult life and it's had expression in lots of different ways even um, sort of a wicker at mm. one point, you were sort of out in the woods doing sort of I was, nature I worship was. and that yeah. kind of thing. Um, I think you've also, you know, uh, had a period where Buddhism has been kind of quite central to your life. Mm -hmm. So having gone through all of those different ways of engaging, what, what made you arrive at Christianity? Well, I suppose that this sense of the sacred or the divine or this religious sense, whatever you call it, which has always been with me, um, it just became stronger as I got older. The more I thought about, if, if, you, if you approach, say you're looking at the environmental crisis and you start saying, mm. well, why is this happening then? You sort of cycle through a lot of questions. And if you keep asking the questions, you, you say, well, maybe it's politics. Maybe we need someone else in power. And then you realize it's not that. And mm. then you say, well, maybe we need a revolution. Well, no, that's not going to happen. And, and it probably would make it worse. Maybe it's about capitalism. Well, it is, but it's bigger than that as well. 
maybe it's about industrialism yeah it sort of is that but it's bigger than that as well you keep going down and down and down and you realize that as, as i say i think that what the crisis is not technological or economic or political it's it's cultural which means actually it's spiritual because it's about our relationship with the rest of life mm. and and what we think a human is and what we think nature is and what we think the world is and then that's a theological question that's mm -hmm. a spiritual question so by the time i was 40 or so i thought well i i think i need to go and I need a I need a spiritual path here. Mm. I think I need to f to learn from the wisdom of the ages because I you know there's something bigger going on. So yeah, I, I the first place I went was was Buddhism, which is often the case with Western people these mm -hmm. days because Buddhism, Buddhism Buddhism is very accessible. So I spent about five or six years studying Zen and practicing Zen and Chan Buddhism, which was very productive and I did learn a lot and I had a lot of experiences. I mm. especially learned a lot about the nature of the self. Buddhism is very good at teaching you the the nature of the kind of the full self mm. but there was also something missing from it um and i wasn't sure what it was but i sort of realized to my horror that maybe it was god <laughs> <laughs> i thought oh. no this can't be true <laughs> no or I'd, so i didn't want to use that word but i thought well i, I don't know I, I sort of wanted to worship something which i thought was a bit weak of me um but there was a lack of relationship somehow in buddhism for me it wasn't right. a relationship to the... I felt like there was a source of something. There was something big going on, and mm. I didn't have a relation to it w with Buddhism. So so at the same time, I was studying. I was reading mythology. I was spending... Going on four-day retreats in the woods, four days of fasting in Dartmoor um, in the woods, and doing all sorts of other things as well. And eventually, I ended up thinking, well, look, I I, maybe I need a nature religion, right? Because I mm. love nature. I should have mm. a nature religion. That That might work, so... I've always been very interested in sort of magic and things. So I ended up, as you say, joining a Wiccan coven. Mm. So a sort of new age witchy thing for a while. For a couple of years, I did that. And that was interesting as well. I learned some things from that. But Wicca is, is a sort of false made up religion that with, with lots of different aspects of things cobbled together from kind of the Masons and, and uh, Alistair Crowley and all sorts of other stuff like that. So some of it's interesting, but some of it's a bit sinister. Mm -hmm. don't realize that till you're in it not deliberately so but i think that that kind of thing is playing with powers that the people involved in it don't necessarily realize they're playing with okay. but anyway um what really happened was i still had a sense that this wasn't quite right and, and then all sorts of strange things started happening to me i had a dream about jesus and i thought what was that about <laughs> i wrote it down it was so very particular and then i started having sort of Weirdly, I kept meeting Christians everywhere. So I felt like something <laughs> was happening, right? So I, I felt like all these Christians were coming towards me. At the time, I was running this <laughs> writing class, and suddenly I was had all these priests saying, can you help me with my writing? Don't and you hate it when that happens? Terrible. I know, they're everywhere. And then, then, I, then I'd do things like discovering that friends of mine who I hadn't known were Christian were actually Christian, and, and then all sorts of stuff. And then it was just suddenly it was Christians everywhere. And I was going, what's going on? <laughs> and then I really started to have a sense that, that I was being dragged out of Wicca by something or someone mm. and being told not to do this anymore and I felt like I knew who it was but I didn't want to think about that <laughs> <laughs> but if, a lot of things happened to me to mm. cut a long story, story short and it was partly a sort of intellectual uh, dissatisfaction with what I was doing but more than that it was actually a lot of experiences uh, mm. I felt like I was being really forcibly dragged towards Christianity and you know C.S. Lewis wrote about this very famously mm. didn't he for mm. want, uh, fearing the, the approach of the one who he desperately desired not to meet it was a bit like that yes so in the end i just thought oh, maybe i'm a christian damn <laughs> this is bad i don't want to be a christian don't like christians don't like this this is bad but you know that then of course i started to look into to christianity and, and start reading the real getting into the real meat of it mm. and then of course you realize that it's not what you thought it was and that the depth of it and the cosmology of it is really not what you thought you learned at mm. school Mm. And it's very badly communicated <laughs> to us, unfortunately. The, the, well, the, the trendy vicars attention. didn't didn't trendy have the whole, didn't do whole it. story. I, mean, they're, they're hard, I, <laughs> I appreciate their efforts, but it wasn't uh, the attempt to make Christianity relevant just makes it less relevant. Um, but yeah. anyway, so I just started looking around and wa walking into churches and sitting at the back and things. And eventually, uh, I walked into an Orthodox monastery, a new Orthodox monastery that's opened in Ireland, the first one, very small, just a few minutes from my home actually and uh, I went to the divine liturgy and I'd never experienced anything like that before and after you've been to two or three you can't stop and uh, here I am now I turn out to be an orthodox Christian and you know it's interesting there's a friend of mine Martin Shaw who you've spoken to before mm. And uh, he's also recently become an orthodox Christian mm. after 10 years of being a sort of pagan storyteller. <laughs> yeah. I know Martin very well and 
somebody asked him recently they said why did you convert to christianity then and he said i don't think i did i think i just realized i was a christian all along mm. and i kind of feel the same actually I kind of feel like when you join the orthodox church people say welcome home it's very nice mm. and it's a weird thing in one mm. way because i'm a member of the romanian orthodox church mm. not my home i'm not romanian yeah but in another way in a deeper way it does feel like that it feels yeah. like you've come back to something you sort of always knew it's a very prodigal mm. son you know you wow. sort of feel like you're coming back to something i did anyway so yeah. i don't feel like i've converted to something weird and new and strange at all i feel like i've gone oh this was yeah, what it this was is all about. I, this yeah. is where I came from. This is what I've been circling around <laughs> yeah. my whole life. So it's a strange feeling. And I'm quite a new Christian. Only two or three years I've been in the church. So I'm still very much feeling my way, mm. you know, but it's... Jump straight yeah. into a it's two the only year way to long do it. theological Let's just throw you. yourself in. You have to go in at the deep end. When you're my age, you know, it's like a, I've got... I wish, I wish I'd started 30 years ago, but anyway. Mm. You've There's got it. so much interesting about what you just said. So many interesting parts. I think what that trust that you have had in yourself, in your mm. inner monologue, that's really interesting. I think that might, if anyone's listening to this who's not a Christian, as Christians, we kind of take that quite seriously, this idea that God speaks, you know, in that this whole, you know, deep to deep type mm. sort of thing. But if you're not a Christian, that's quite quite countercultural to tr to sort of listen to your inner monologue and think there's a real weight here and actually this might be more than just me this might be some kind of external force mm. trying to communicate with me yeah i think that's the countercultural bit isn't it because we're we're very good at listening to our inner monologue when it's about us you know <laughs> we're very good at a sort of psychotherapizing individualistic sort of moralistic deism thing but but yeah, the notion that there might be a God and he might be talking to you. I mean, it's, I, I, you know, I, I sort of resisted that idea for a long time. Sounds a bit mad. Mm. And also maybe I'm, maybe I'm hugely self-absorbed and I think I'm a prophet or something. And what's going on? Why would God mm. be talking to me? You know, there mm. was all that going on as well. But I don't know. I've always just thought if, you, if you're going on a... I mean, look, I just sort of started praying at some point in a crude way and just saying, OK, well, if you're real, tell me what to do. Show me what's going on. Tell me mm. where I should go then. Um, I think it's sort of the only thing you can do. But I, I think for a long time, I'd just been looking. I've been searching for so long. I just thought I've got to follow mm. whatever comes. What's mm. the worst that can happen? I'll just be wrong and then I can go and do something else. But, but yeah, it? You, what, you, what, it turns out that if you start praying, <laughs> you get an answer, <laughs> which is actually quite quite frightening. So that was what happened, I it, think. It reminds me a bit of that, that C.S. Lewis passage. I can't remember it very well, but where he, he sort of talks about the fact that a lot of people want a kind of God that's a sort of impersonal force or a mm. sort of God in their own mold that yes. doesn't challenge them too much. But then when people discover this kind of untamed living God mm. on the end of the line, that's that's a very kind of different concept yeah, because yeah. That, that suddenly means, oh, I'm not in the driving seat anymore. Mm. There is something beyond me. Aslan is not a safe lion. Uh, yes, he's <laughs> not a tame lion. He's not a tame yeah, lion, no. Yeah. Exactly. No, yeah. that's, that's the thing, you see. So it's a radical kind of discovery that prayer's a thing. You know, mm. prayer mm. actually is a real thing because, again, at school it was... It's a funny thing, I did... I'm not really blaming anyone, but you know, no one taught you what any of this was really. You mm. just go to assembly and they go, right, let us pray. And you go, what does that mean? What am I supposed to do? I just say these words. Mm. But yeah, actually ha trying to talk and then thinking like something might actually have happened as a response yeah. to that, as a result of that. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a weird, I, I'm very fascinated because thing very. actually. I've, I've got kids and, and the, the thought often goes through my mind, you know, when they're at school and they do happen to go to a, a Church of England school. Mm. But lots of their friends obviously had absolutely no faith and don't come yeah. from church families and so on. And, and I sometimes wonder, going through those, you know, things, prayer, you know, your hymn or whatever, what impact does it make? Obviously on you, it, it mm. had very little impact. And yet, at the same time, I don't want that to just disappear entirely from our cultural experience. Well, yeah, I mean, this is people. interesting, you know, because you say it had little impact, but I'm not sure that's true. Um, I, did, had any, I didn't think it had any impact at the time. I wasn't interested in right. it. But it did give me a foundation in what Christianity broadly was. Yes. I, I had to learn the Lord's Prayer at school. Yeah. So I always mm. knew that. And I'd listen to the Gospels. I wasn't very interested, but I'd hear the stories. Mm. And I had to do the Nativity play and sing some hymns. And that gives you an under, a basic foundation of Christianity, actually, um, which I don't think is available for a lot of children these days, actually. Yes. I think that the younger generation often now haven't even got that foundation. So stuff we took for granted, like, you know, 
a quote from the Bible or something mm. that Jesus said, regardless of whether you're a Christian, it's kind of in the language. It's like yeah. Shakespeare. It's mm. here. Mm. Um, so I think it did have an impact on me. It didn't at the time. I didn't think it had any spiritual impact on me, but it gave me a sort of ground of just understanding what mm. that story is mm. that I could then come back to later and go, right, okay, I want to dig deeper into it. But I sort of, at least I knew the broad outline of mm. what, the, what the picture was. So I think it mm. did have an impact in that way, actually. Yeah. Yeah. A mm. cultural, you know, gives you a cultural grounding. Even if you reject it, it's still there. Yeah. If you want to come back, you can come back. Mm. So, yeah, I do think that matters, actually. Mm. So, do you think there are more people, many more people, who sort of have always been a Christian mm. <laughs> in sort of what you said, those people who, despite their expectations, and they want, because, you know, mm. people will be reluctant, but it's already within them? Well, I suppose we'll find out, won't we? I mean, what I think is if God is real, then God is real and that means everybody has a longing for God and actually I think that's true because I think even if you look at it anthropologically historically every culture in the world is built around God in some way yeah. they may have a different understanding of it they may be wrong or right about this that or the other but they're all focusing at some point on where they think the divine is it's always at the heart of every culture except this one which has decided to pretend that's not real for a bit mm. but that's not going to work because mm. I think humans have a need for it they have a need for God because that's what we're supposed to do. That's where we're supposed to be orientated. So if that's true, then we're going to want to look in that direction, mm -hmm. even though the whole culture is telling us that that's nonsense. Sort of, we sort of know it isn't, but we don't, it's very difficult to know where to look in this society. Mm -hmm. But I do think possibly that that's true because I, since I started writing about this and talking about it, I didn't really intend to go around writing and talking about Christianity all the time. <laughs> it just seems to have happened and I thought, well, uh, maybe I should do it because maybe that's what I'm supposed to do with mm. this writing thing I have. Maybe that's what God wants me to do or maybe I should just do it to help others out. But since I've started doing it, I've had a lot of letters and emails. I can't even answer them all from people who are in a similar sort of position on a similar yeah. journey, often coming from a similar place, who said, yes, much to my horror and surprise, I'm also attracted to Christianity. What do I do? And I can't really <laughs> help but except by telling the story. And it, just by talking like this, other people can look and say, oh, yes. yeah, maybe it's all right. Maybe it's not just me. Maybe I'm not mad. We, we spoke you know, to Francis Bufford earlier in the series, mm. And, mm. and he said something quite similar. Well, he, he basically said sometimes it's about having people who aren't the people you'd expect maybe mm. to start talking about Christianity, yeah. that that suddenly opens that it up for people. And, and um, he obviously, you know, is a brilliant writer and, mm. uh, and so on. And, and I think it was a refreshing when suddenly he wrote about Christianity mm. in his book, Unapologetic, and, and in a very different, unique way yeah. as well. Um, uh, and we've also mentioned Nick Cave a few times on this mm. podcast. A few times. But if you're listening, Nick, the, the door's still open <laughs> yeah, to, come to, on. to the interview. Yeah, mentioned like six um, times now. <laughs> um, but again, someone who's who I think, you know, very influential pop star, rock star, but seems to kind of just be voicing what I think a lot of people are feeling deep mm. down. No, there's maybe there is a god maybe yeah. maybe this mm. this feeling mm. and i kind of also recognizing like so many people that as you say we're the only culture that has kind of banished god mm. but we're still no less religious we're just getting religious about different things yeah. Mm. Yeah, and exactly. and it's not like that that instinct goes away it just no. gets subverted in some way no i mean what, what are you seeing in terms of that do you would you say i don't know do you think we're ready for the real god story to come back in our culture well, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, you know, Chesterton said, Chesterton was arguing with Marx. He said, it's not true that religion is the opium of the people. It's irreligion, which is the opium of the people, because if you don't worship something beyond the world, you will worship the world. Mm. And above all, you will worship the strongest thing in the world, mm -hmm. which is true. So it's true. You get your religious gaze uh, directed towards, well, this is what idol worship is, right? That you, you start worshiping the world instead what we worship is money we worship wealth above all i think we worship technology uh, and you can see where that's going that's going towards transhumanism artificial intelligence to attempt to create our own god to be god in fact that's where we're going um, and i think that the more that that is openly the case the more that we try to remake human nature remake nature itself behave like gods um the more people are going to start saying, well, hang on a minute, what, what actually is happening here? The more you have to ask this question, what is a human? What is nature? What is mm -hmm. the world? And that's going to focus a lot of people's minds. And I think mm -hmm. it already is. I think people will be ready 
for actual serious Christianity again, you know, full strength Christianity, not the weak worldly <laughs> version, the real thing. And I think it's starting to happen. You know, I can feel it, especially amongst younger people, interestingly. Yeah. In my generation, younger people, you know, I've, I've heard so many stories. I mean, even somebody like Jordan Peterson, who isn't a Christian, although we can't stop talking about it for some reason. I don't know what's going on there, but he'll give lectures about the uh, two-hour lectures about the book of Genesis and it'll fill up with 20-year-olds. You know, yeah. that would never have happened mm. 20 years ago, even yeah. five years ago. There's something going on that's pulling people towards towards it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it seems to have happened to me. <laughs> and I think it's happening to a lot of other people as well. So, yeah, I think it's like the more worldly we become, the more we worship the world, the more we start to do increasingly dark and disturbing things trying to cr ex live forever, upload our minds into the mm. cloud, create mm. new life itself, the more this, this sort of pull towards actual faith, an actual God, rather than the false one, yeah. is going gonna, is gonna to be stronger, I think. I have a feeling that's happening already. Mm. And you, you said then, a uh, full strength Christianity. Mm. You've found yourself, you found a pull to quite an ancient form of Christianity. Mm. What is it that you're finding there that you don't see in like sort of more modern Christianity? Um, Christianity, again, to mention a previous um, guest, Tom Holland, mm. Christianity that you said has bled itself of enchantment. Um, I think you might have called it a bleached out Christianity. Mm, I think um, so, yeah, it feels yeah. like that. Can you talk us through sort of the, what well, you're finding? It's a funny thing because, you know, I'm English, so maybe I should have been Anglican and <laughs> I, I live in Ireland, so maybe I should be Catholic. And I was looking around at all the churches you become a Christian, you think, well, what's the church then? There seem to be about a hundred of them. What's the actual real one? <laughs> Where should I be going here? So I was praying a lot about that, but I was also going to churches and sitting in them and seeing what happened. And yeah. Eventually, as I said, I went to this Orthodox monastery and that was a very powerful experience. I met a priest there and I talked to him and I just kept going and going and going. And the, there was an experience in the divine liturgy in the Orthodox church, which I haven't had anywhere else. The Orthodox liturgy is usually at least two hours long. You stand up all the way through, right? Um, the Orthodox, say the Orthodox Easter service will start at 10 p.m. and finish at 2 a.m. No messing around with wow. the Orthodox. <laughs> Sometimes people ask me the difference between Eastern and Western Christianity. I say Eastern Christians have better beards and stronger legs. Um, <laughs> that's fundamentally the difference. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's something. Ortho Orthodox Christianity comes from the East. Uh, and and it's, it's two things have happened there. Um, firstly, it's been persecuted for much of its history by either by Islam or later by communism, um, which has made it very strong, paradoxically. Mm. It hasn't mm. had very much power. Mm. And secondly, it hasn't had to deal with modernity. It didn't have a reformation, didn't have the Enlightenment, mm. didn't have the Renaissance. So it hasn't been sort of had to hasn't been sort of hacked about by humanism, <laughs> basically, <laughs> in the same way. And so you, uh, and it also has a much more mystical core, I think, than Western Christianity. Obviously, there's mysticism in Western Christianity, too. But generally, I think it's it's ended up, especially in the Protestant countries, much more moralistic and rationalistic. And that was the sort of Christianity that I proud came across at school, I think. It's a, it's a sort of a list of moral rules. Mm -hmm. And obviously the moral rules matter in Christianity, mm -hmm. but they're not the heart of the thing. They mm -hmm. exist for a reason. And I found in the Orthodox faith, firstly, something which hasn't been compromised and muddied around by the modern world, but also something which can take you really much deeper than I've ever experienced in, in the Western church. And I think especially in the West since the 60s, the church, all the churches, the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, all of them have tried to, I don't know if they've tried to compromise with modernity, but they've tried to make the church more appealing. You know, mm. we've got to, that, that's the trendy vicars, right? And, yeah. and I don't blame them. It's a, it's a sort of rational thing to do. They think, well, everyone, no one's interested in the church anymore. Maybe if we make it, maybe if we make the hymns sound like pop songs, people mm. will come back. But they won't because they just want the pop songs. <laughs> and then the church looks weak. So weirdly enough, the more the church has tried to speak to or adapt itself to secular modernity, the more it just seemed like a compromised thing mm. that doesn't have anything alternative mm. to say. Whereas mm. now, I think when people are looking at Christianity, they say, look, what's the alternative to the world? Which is actually what Christianity is supposed to be, right? St. Paul says, don't be conformed to this mm. world. The church is not the world. It's in the world, but it's mm. not of the world. Mm. So we're not supposed to be conformed to the world. And now that the world is becoming so awful in so many ways, people will say, well, where's the temple of God? Yeah. What's, what's happening in the temple of God? And if it's the same thing as is happening in the world, if it's just activist politics or, you know, pop songs or whatever, then why would you go? What, has it remained? If it's the word of God, it should remain unchanged, right? And it should mm. be strong and it should be beautiful as well. The other thing about orthodoxy is there's a great deal of beauty in it. The mm. icons and the, the incense, it's a kind of full bodily experience that really... Yeah. 
feels very powerful. So there's something in there that's that I think we have lost in the West or given away. You've but been, I think we could get it back, actually. Uh, and one of the areas I know that you've been interested in is is sort of looking into that ancient world and the the wild saints mm. uh, as, as a way of kind of re-enchanting our view of the world. Do you want to talk a bit about that and your own interest in sort of charting some of their lives and stories and so on? Yeah, well, this is my own little personal thing that interests me it's like as, a, as a kind of a nature lover, somebody who I always feel kind of happy and is camping in the woods. So um, I'm really interested in the hermits and I'm really interested in the, in the ascetic tradition of the Desert Fathers. But I'm very particularly interested in how that played out in Britain and in Ireland where I live um, because there's such a tradition in the early centuries of the church here of um, saints taking to what they called the Green Desert, going out to the islands, making hermitages, living in caves, um, living this very ascetic tradition, very close to nature, very simple. Uh, and there are so many saints like this. Uh, in Britain, you have saints like St. Cuthbert of Lindisfarne or St. Aidan, St. Govan of Pembrokeshire. Mm. Um, so many of these early saints, especially even more of them in Ireland, St. Kevin and St. Coleman and uh, the monks on Skellig, Michael, and you can barely walk 100 yards <laughs> in Ireland without coming across an island with some old hermitage on it or a cave where a saint lived. Mm. And in the Eastern tradition, that's very strong as well. Mm. Um, and a lot of these saints have this great, powerful relationship with the natural world. Um, they have relationships with birds who feed them, or they befriend bears. Saint Seraphim of Sarov, the Russian mm. saint, befriended a bear. Whenever you see an icon of him, it's always got a bear in it, which well, I really the, like. Yeah. Um, so there's this sense that actually at the heart of the Christian faith, right here, um, always, is this very simple ascetic tradition where we're part of creation, we're yeah. part of nature, uh, you love God and you see God at least partly through the things that God has created. And I'm very inspired by that, mm. partly. You know, I'm a nature lover, yeah. so that yeah. speaks mm. to me a lot. And I also think it's something culturally that we can rediscover that's our heritage here in mm. England or mm. in the West generally. I don't have to go to Russia to find it, right? This is, this is the, everyone was the church at this point. There was no Orthodox or Catholic or anything. These are just Christian saints living in a very beautiful way. And I just have a sort of sense that that's, one way of re-enchanting and re-empowering Christianity is not the only way, but it's mm. a way that interests me. Um, so, yeah, I've just been sort of writing about that, thinking about it and exploring the Who's, who's your favourite saint, if you had to choose one? Well, my favourite saint at the moment is a, a very little-known saint called Saint Coleman MacDoo, who lived in the west of Ireland in a little mm. cave in the Burren. Um, which I actually slept in on the eve of my 50th birthday oh, as a I little pilgrimage. <laughs> I made a pilgrimage to this cave. This is kind of a weird thing I do. Uh, St. Coleman weird. lived in this cave for seven years and he built a little oratory church. The ruin of it is there and there's a little spring that comes out of the mountain, a holy mm. well. He just lived in the woods here until the local king asked him to come out and found a monastery and then he had to do that, but he didn't really want to. And later on, after he'd been the bishop, he retired and he went back to live in the borough and he just lived with the birds. And a uh, beautiful saint. There's a story about St. Coleman. He had uh, three animal friends. He had a cockerel and a mouse and a crow who he befriended and trained. So the cockerel's job was to wake him up for <laughs> prayer in the morning at the right time. The mouse's job, if he didn't want to get up to pray, was to bite him on the ear <laughs> till he got out of bed. Uh, and, the, and the fly's job was to walk along the lines of the Bible in the dark so he could read <laughs> the lines. Wow. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful story. So, yeah. so many of these stories are around of these saints. So... And there's a very beautiful place you can still visit, St. Coleman's Cave, and it's not very much visited. But, you know, there's something very wonderful there, very mm. serious, beautiful, ascetic Christianity that really speaks mm. to me. And it's something that we've certainly lost a long time ago. But it's accessible again. Mm. You know, it's accessible. Yeah. It's, it's still there. The saints are still in the land. The stories are still there. The caves are still there. So mm. I, th I find that very, very exciting, actually. Yeah, I think I don't think you're the only one. I'm seeing, you know, particularly the desert mothers and fathers. Mm. They are getting brought up a lot. I, oh, think, I noticed that too. Yeah. yeah, there's a real because I think the the way they holistically embodied their faith mm. is is so great. And I think what I notice about people like these saints and the desert mothers and fathers, and I'm from Pembrokeshire, which I enjoy, has been shouted out a lot today. <laughs> so you know, Saint Govan and all of that, and sort of living in a very rural place is what it teaches you about humanity. Mm. You sort of, they have a really um, complex, nuanced, beautiful sense of what makes a human mm. and how to interact with those things. And I think maybe, I wonder if that's one of the reasons we're, we're sort of craving that as well. Yeah. And I think there's a very, there are some very beautiful old Irish Christian poems about 
hermits living in huts celebrating the beauty of the woodland glade and it's you know it's a time when people are really concerned about nature and the destruction of creation and here's a christian answer to that which is not to be a pantheist or a wiccan or, or to a nature mm. worshiper but mm. just to see creation as 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 something that you can see god in i mean another thing that's very important in the orthodox faith is the notion that god is both transcendent and imminent so you can mm. really experience god in creation he's mm. not creation you're not worshiping god you're yeah. not worshiping creation but you can see god in creation chesterton again he said nature is not our mother she's our sister which i really like mm. so mm. you know you can f experience god in yes. the, the 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 energy of god in the world and i think that's really true and it's a it's a christian response to to the crisis that we're in which is not just to say hey let's be sustainable christians it's to say you know, let's get out here mm. and and see what god has to say what happens if we worship in a cave <laughs> instead of a city the other thing about the desert fathers and the mothers is they left the city and the, and the culture at a time when they thought it had become complacent and corrupt because the christians were getting very comfortable the martyrdoms yeah. had stopped and the christians had become established and the desert fathers mm. saint anthony was saying what's this there's all just these craved a bit of suffering christians they? well they did they just wanted <laughs> yeah. to they wanted to get out they just wanted yeah. the simplicity of it they yeah. wanted to strip themselves back mm. um and that's I, I find that very appealing i mean you know i haven't done it have i so <laughs> at least not well, for any length I, I of was, time i was gonna say it, it sounds amazing that that's the thing. but then it's like oh but then you realize i live in the modern world mm. um and it's you know, I, I can understand why there's that attraction. They're very romantic stories in many ways mm. and, and that sort of way of life and so on. I know that you in your own life tried to embody that to some extent and you can go on the odd, you know, vigil, you know, in the forest mm. and whatever, but you still have to communicate by email like mm. everyone else and you still have to get on Zoom and do podcasts that way. And, and to some extent, can you put the genie back in the bottle even if we try and sort of help people to reconnect so, to some extent with the world around them through the stories of these people we don't live in the same world that they did do we so so for what will we do well i don't know to some degree we don't the civilization is much bigger and more digital and more interconnected but in another way these guys were living at the height of the roman empire mm -hmm. um, which is the biggest empire you'd ever seen mm. um so in a way we do okay um, the other thing to think about of course is that only a minority of people ever did this it's not something a majority Christ, most yeah, christians yeah. ever did right most christians have lived in the world had families mm -hmm. worked in the world like we're all doing most of them are not living in caves most of them are not monastics but you need the monastics and you need the people living in caves uh, and you need mount athos and you need the the ascetics because they're the people you go to when you, you want to drink at the source you know mm. they they kind of feed you in the world i think it's another great mistake that we made in the west is that the destruction of the monastics and the destruction of the monasteries, especially in Britain, um, was was just a disaster. Because I, I, I have a strong sense that that you need you need people there really holding that the, the mm. tradition of the Desert Fathers, the really hardcore serious right. people. Most of us are not going to do that. But you know, if I, I worship in a monastery, I, I visited Mount Athos, I visited monasteries. When I go there, it gives me enough strength to come back out right. into the world. So it's almost like you. Th those are the people who kind of hold the flag. I think they and, do. And, I think and they then hold we the can sort of be. And we're be all, you know, we're it. all Christians in the world. We're all following. We're all worshiping together. So it's not us and them. But there's a there's these are people who've dedicated their whole life purely to that. Right. And we can go and see that, and we can experience that. And for me, anyway, but you can bring that, that back out again. Under threat, because I, I read one of your recent Substacks about going to Mount Athos mm. and being slightly horrified by the fact they now had the internet mm. and um, you well know, and th this was a place where until relatively recently you couldn't even drive a car and that yeah, kind of thing yeah yeah no it certainly it's, it does bother me um uh, that there's <laughs> i think this it's it's a bigger question about what critique of technology christians should have or yeah. anyone any human should mm. have actually and um, we need to have a really smart understanding of what our relationship with screens does and our relationship with mobile things does because you know that's that's the world that's literally the world. If you've got that in your pocket, you can yeah. look at any aspect of the world. So the funny thing today is you can go out into the remotest landscape and still get a signal. Mm -hmm. You can be just as much part of the world as you could in the center of London in that sense. So, yeah, you've got to have a critical relationship mm -hmm. with that. But there are also monasteries out there that refuse to have anything to do with technology. There are monasteries out there that refuse to let a, a phone. I, actually, somebody told me about an American Orthodox monastery that has a little sign outside that says smartphones are liable to be smashed, <laughs> which, which I liked. <laughs> I approve and I want to visit. So, you know, anything's possible. Anything's possible. We're not all going to be monastics. We're not all going to be living in caves, but you can go and do this for a while. You can go and see those who are. And that, that kind of powerful, strong essence mm. of the thing. Mm is like I say, it feels like drinking a, drinking a, f a spring of water that you need to somehow sometimes refresh mm. yourself from, I think, for me anyway. Mm. Mm. On the flip side of that, 
the l much less romantic side of that. Um, some of your writing recently is focused on AI mm. and the sort of your fears surrounding that. And spirit is there a spiritual fear that you have um, when it comes to that and where technology is progressing? Well, I do. This is another one of my weird spiritual intuitions, but I think that um, I'm very struck by the fact that the people who are developing artificial intelligences at the moment are all really scared of it. Yeah, right? that's the people not great, actually it? Yeah. making it mm. are saying, oh. That's never a good sign, is it? It's not a good sign. <laughs> never a good sign. <laughs> they're all signing moratoriums saying, let's stop this happening, but they're not stopping it. They're all saying, we don't even really know what's going on with these things. They're doing things we didn't expect them to do. There was an article in Time magazine recently of all, all sort of sensible establishment publications by an AI developer who said, look, this, is, this stuff is so bad, we're going to have to consider bombing the data centers around the world <laughs> to stop the development of AIs because they're so dangerous. Gosh. These are not internet crazies. These are the developers, right? So there's something very strange going on with AI and digital technology more generally. And if I wanted to take a, if I wanted to take a cosmic Christian perspective, I'd say it's almost as if it's being inhabited by something dark and demonic. Mm -hmm as if it's like coming through at us. I don't know if that's true, but there's something. It's the concentrated essence of the world. It's the concentrated essence of mm. materialism and our mm. love of money. And it feels to me like something's using it. You know, it feels very disturbing. Now, maybe that's a crazy idea, but it certainly feels, even if you want to just be purely practical about it, that something very out of control is going on. And even mm. the people who are doing it know that something very out of control is going yeah. on. And it's going to change absolutely everything about our relationship with the world. And it's another one of these things that's going to concentrate minds, I think. You know, if we're starting to talk about whether we can make humans live forever, or whether we can make intelligences which feel like humans, whether we can, you know, an AI only needs to hear three seconds of a human voice to completely perfectly imitate it. We're going to have a kind of, one of these developers has called this a reality collapse, where we can't tell the difference mm -hmm. between what's real and what's not. It becomes even more urgent to say, well, what does it mean to be human? Are we made in the image of God? Because if we are, we can't create a new version of ourselves. What's, it's one of these things I think that's going to concentrate the mind on, on what the truth is. Yeah. I, see, at the, the problem is you always sound like a Luddite when you say things like well, this. Well, I am a bit of a Luddite, <laughs> yeah, so that's fine. <laughs> and, and you, like you're going to go in and start smashing the data centers yes. or whatever, just like they did the, the spinning jennies and whatnot. But I suppose it does feel a bit different to those other industrial revolutions and things it does feel like it's it's kind of got as you say sort of a life of its mm. own there's there's something else going on there and i could kind of understand your concern at that because it's a little bit like well you were saying you know some of your friends in the wiccan movement were dealing with forces they didn't fully understand mm. it feels again a bit yes. like we're dealing with a force well, we don't you know understand in, in, in wicca in a lot of these places what you do is you go off and you you open a portal and then you invite things to come through that's what the magicians are doing so it's almost like with the internet, we're opened a portal and we've asked something to come through and something's coming through. That's, that's mm. a disturbing possibility. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the AI critics I was reading recently, he said, you know, people compare AIs to nuclear weapons, but they're worse than that because nuclear weapons can't create other nuclear weapons, whereas AIs can create other AIs. <laughs> so something very, very significant is happening and not just with AI, but with the whole mm. transhumanist movement, which mm. aims, you, list, you can read... Um, and listen to leading transhumanists openly saying we're making God, we're building God. Ray Kurzweil, who's the head of engineering at Google, great philosopher of the singularity, somebody asked him if God existed and he said, not yet, right? Because he uh, thinks I'm he's going to make it. Yeah, yeah right. So right. That's, this yeah. is the new theology. So again, wow. this is something that makes you think, well, I mean, I, I gave a talk yesterday about this in, in, at Unheard in London and I said, look, I think... You, we're getting to the point where you have to choose your religion, right? Because this is a new religion. And if you don't choose your religion, you're going to get, this is the one that's going to be handed to you on a kind of default plate. So is there a God? What are humans? Are we made in the image of God? What is creation? You have to find some answers, actually. Mm. <laughs> and these are, these are, again, the things that sort of concentrate the mind, I think. Yeah, I'm thinking the deep philosophical thinker, Tom Hanks, mm. <laughs> said recently <laughs> um, that by the time he'll die, or he sort of, he sort of said it in jest. But I think there's a real truth to it. He'll die, and then what will happen probably is an AI version of Tom Hanks will star in all these films. It will. And he said people will mm. know, but people by that point won't care. And there's there's actually like a bit. I think of we're depth already that. at that point almost because it feels a bit like people have almost decided. Yeah, I don't really mind if ChatGPT or a chat bot is what I'm actually interacting with. Because sometimes I prefer that experience mm -hmm. to an actual real human. They're, they mm. don't talk back. They don't get upset with me. I can say what I like and, and everything else. And, and 
I mean, is that the kind of the new religion you're talking about, Paul? Think, where yeah, where, where it so, sort yeah. of is? Well, it's it's the new religion, and it's the very old religion. It's it's the religion of the snake in the Garden of Eden, isn't it? It's like you can be gods too. Don't listen to God. Eat the knowledge of the, eat the tree of knowledge. It's um, I mean, there's already an AI Bruce Willis, by the way, which is, is featured it? in a Russian advert for oh. something or other. They made because he Bruce Willis can't act anymore. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So that yeah. it's quite convincing, apparently. But yeah, it's exactly that, and um. There is a sense of, yeah, there's a sense of uh, just the ability to create entirely new things. We think we're creating new life. It's what we think we're doing. So if you don't believe there's a God, which we don't anymore, and if you don't believe that life has any inherent meaning, because humans aren't made in the image of God and, and nothing mm. else is either, then the world is just a mass of material stuff. It hasn't got any meaning or direction. So if that's true... There's no reason not to manipulate it, to genetically modify it, mm -hmm. to create new life, to make yourself live mm -hmm. forever. Why wouldn't mm -hmm. you? Because you're not going to live after death. Mm -hmm. So there's no other. Uh, and there's no moral reason not to do yeah. that or ethical reason mm -hmm. not to do it. In fact, you can make an ethical argument that you could improve on nature and say, well, let's get rid of sickness. Let's get rid yeah. of illness. People shouldn't have to suffer their loved ones dying. So mm -hmm. that's appealing. And as you say, I think we've kind of got used to the fact already that we're interacting with mm -hmm. weird robot things. Mm -hmm. We're already talking to them online. Mm -hmm. Um, there was another AI developer who said that in five years' time, everyone's best friend will be an AI. You know, because why not? Because they're always there for you. They don't go to sleep. They don't let you down. Uh, <laughs> and let's not even get into the world of sex robots, yeah. which are definitely coming. Yeah. They're on the way. Um, why not? I mean, blimey, you could have sex with anyone you wanted. They do anything you want, and there's no ethical problems with that, apparently. No one's going to get upset. It's what? the ultimate commodification, of course in a sense. Is, yeah. yeah. So we create, a f if we can create, a f it's, it's a really interesting philosophical question. If we can create a fake version of a person mm. that will pretty much do anything we want, whether it's be our friend or have sex with us or, or whatever, mm. would we like to do that? Mm. Probably a lot of people would. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, and, and why not? Why not deal with a robot on the other end of the line that might be more efficient mm. than a person? Mm. AI priests. I wrote something about oh this gosh. recently. There are already AI priests. <laughs> There's a, a robot in Germany called Bless You Too, which can forgive your sins in five different languages. Wow. Uh, it would be funny a, if it weren't so tragic. Yes, at the same no. Time, there's there's, there's a it's Catholic like, yeah. statue called Santos, which if you ask it questions, will respond with the Bible quote. Wow. Because of course, an AI has got the whole Bible in there. It can mm, memorize sure. it probably better than an actual priest. So what happens at this point? Are people happy? Are they not happy? Mm. This is this. These are the things that are going to start rolling out over the next few years. So I, I like to say, I think it's going to concentrate a lot of minds on, mm. on what is actually going on here. We're going to get AI saints, do you reckon? <laughs> That's a, only a matter of time <laughs> before this kind of thing starts to be proposed. Yes, exactly. Maybe they'll be more holy than actual humans. <laughs> then we're really getting into the thickets, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. we really the are. The theological weeds. Yeah. Yeah. What would be your advice then? to Christianity, we were facing these sort of, these cultural issues? Well, I don't know, I don't think I'm qualified to give advice to Christianity. Yeah, it's quite a big um, question, I like, no, about what I, I've just asked you. I try to avoid that sort of question <laughs> with my two years of experience in the church. Um, I think that the Christians, the same as everybody else, are gonna have to have a really intelligent relationship with technology and with modern society in general and start saying to themselves, what are my boundaries? What are the limits? Right. And where do we stop? Because if we don't stop, we're just going to be sucked in this mm. direction. Mm. I always I always go back to thinking about the Amish, actually. The Amish right. have a very intelligent relationship with technology. People often assume that they just like living like 17th century Christians. But actually, the, the, the principle behind a lot of Amish communities is that any new technology that comes into their culture, into their community, they'll, they might test it out for six months or a year. And they'll always be asking, what impact does this have on our community? So maybe okay. we'll give smartphones a go. Mm. And then after a year, mm. the community gets together and they'll say, has this improved it? Has it made it worse? Shall we keep it? Some of them they might reject, some of them they might not. So different communities will accept different things. Some of them won't even have telephones. Some of them will have landlines, but not smartphones. If everybody had mm. that kind of intelligent attitude to everything that came along, mm. if we mm. just said, what's this doing for me, mm. for my mm. soul, for my mm. body, for my mm. family, for my community? It's not a blanket rejection of technology. It's certainly not a blanket acceptance of it either. Right. It's critical, intelligent relationships. So maybe a Christian response is to do that spiritually and say, what actual relationship is this? What's this doing to my relationship with God and with creation and with other people? Is, it, uh, is this a false God? Is this, is this an idol? Is this helping? I mean, people will have different answers. But there's, those are the questions I, mm. I, I sort of ask. I don't have a solution to them all. 
but you know, where are you going to draw your line? What what are you not going to do? Mm. Are you going to allow Elon Musk to put a link in your brain <laughs> or not? Or does that sound like a bad idea? Where would you are you going to talk to an AI or not? Everyone's going to have their answers to these things, but you need to think about them. And and I guess you're hoping at least the church might be the last line of defense against that type of digital religion i would like it to be yeah mm. i would like it to be I, w I would like signs on all the churches that say smartphones may be smashed <laughs> you know no digital streaming of, of the eucharist i mean all of these things they yeah I, I would like it to be because it's very easy for everybody to just get sucked into this and to mm. say well this is what everyone does now so yeah. we should all just do it and actually as i say the church as you said actually is supposed to be countercultural, mm. not for the sake of it but just because it's not the culture it's not the world mm. Mm. so it, are we just going to go along with this are we just going to have our phones out are we going to have everything on screens or, or are we going to have the ai robot priests in the corner or, or are we going to say no actually mm. this is actually sacrilegious this is the religion of the world we're going to do something else mm. uh, that would be my preference but what do i know <laughs> quite a lot i think well i don't know <laughs> uh, i i think you're uh, you, you've said repeatedly oh, well i'm only a couple of years into this but as you said I think you came to it after a long life of experience that sort of where you found yourself at home. And I've, I've for one, have really been encouraged by your story and, and the wisdom you're now bringing through your writing, through your speaking to, to not just Christians, but, you know, the world at large. So thank you very much for, for well, being that's, that's to hear. Thank you. You'll make me prideful if you're not careful. So just be, <laughs> watch out, watch out. <laughs> My head will get too big. But yeah, no, I thank you. That's, um, I mean, I do feel like, um, yeah, I'm a very new Christian, but actually there's a, as, as for a lot of people, there's uh, a lot of other stuff that can feed in yeah, a lot of life experience yeah. that actually has has relevance to all of us here. So, yeah, we'll see. Mm. Well, mm. well, thank you, as I say, for being with us on the show today. Um, yeah, probably our time's great. come to an end, but uh, I, ho I hope I hope your story might might just be the turning of a tide somehow um, in our very secular materialist world that we might see more Paul Kingsnorths and others yeah. coming. No, I think I think there will be a lot more. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. Thanks for the conversation. I really enjoyed it.